<laughs> Actually, she's handing it to me. Uh, good afternoon, friends. Uh, on behalf of the ACPE Psychotherapy Commission, it's my pleasure to welcome all participants to this webinar. While this is one of those occasions when the too often used phrase, our speaker needs no introduction, is likely literally true, I do want to call attention to a few highlights of his leadership and service to our professions. Kenneth Pargament is a professor emeritus of psychology at Bowling Green State University and adjunct professor in the Department of Psychiatry at Baylor Medical College. He is widely published in many disciplines. Perhaps his most important book for many of us was The Psychology of Religion and Coping and Spiritually Integrated Psychotherapy. Dr. Pargaman is editor-in-chief of the two-volume APA Handbook of Psychology, Religion, and, Psych uh, and Spirituality. And with Julie Xline, he has authored the recently released Working with Spiritual Struggles in Psychotherapy, from Research to Practice. Hopefully, most of those are in all of our libraries. His awards include the Oscar Pfister Award from the American Psychiatric Association, the Distinguished Service Award from the Association of Professional Chaplains, the first Outstanding Contribution to the Applied Psychology of Religion and Spirituality Award from the Vision 36 of APA. While many others have been recognized by professional organizations as psychiatrists, psychologists, chaplains, and academics for their life contributions, I'm not aware of anyone else who has been so recognized by all of these. Ken has been a close friend of ACPE psychotherapists and ACPE educators in many ways. Today, I do want to highlight with gratitude his close work with Russell Jones in developing our spiritually integrated psychotherapy training program. Ken, thank you for your many contributions to, to our mutual work of healing and flourishing. We're ready to hear your presentation and discussion from <coughs> brokenness to wholeness. Welcome to ACPE. Well, thank you very much, uh, Steve, for that very, very warm and uh, um, flattering introduction. I really appreciate it. And I uh, always enjoy speaking with ACPE. Uh, I feel like I'm really talking to my closest kindred spirits here. So this is a pleasure for me. I'm going to start with a, uh, a confession. Um, I've been a, a lifelong jigsaw puzzler, and uh, it started as a child in my family. Um, some of my happiest memories of my childhood were sitting around our dining room table on a winter day and uh, doing jigsaw puzzles together. With my father telling jokes, he told us dozens of times, um, my mother bringing out hot chocolate. Uh, and I've continued this tradition up to now. It's a little embarrassing to admit. Uh, all other colleagues of mine who've retired or transitioned out of full-time uh, teaching and research uh, have taken up pursuits such as a jazz piano and creating an ethics center in a hospital or volunteering at hospice. Uh, and, and me, I've stayed with my jigsaw puzzling. Um, there's, there's really nothing better uh, than the feeling of finding a piece that fits and, uh, and the sheer joy of shouting out, I found it. And, and to make clear my devotion to, or maybe obsession with jigsaw puzzles, I'm going to share my screen now and uh, show you something here. This is my um, basement wall. It's just part of it. And these are all jigsaw puzzles. Uh, and I've created a jigsaw puzzle of jigsaw puzzles. Uh, I don't know what that says about me, but it says something about me. Actually, over the years, I found it more and more useful to think of our clinical work as, as helping people who come to us often feeling so broken, um, helping them put their lives together. 
Uh, I don't usually put it in terms of jigsaw puzzling with them, but I think the metaphor is still helpful. Um, it's not a perfect metaphor. Unlike jigsaw puzzles, people are always putting the pieces of their lives together. Um, there are always some pieces that are missing and, and we never finish because the picture is always changing. Um, as an aside, I have to admit that maybe another reason I love jigsaw puzzling is that with a jigsaw puzzle, you can reach a point of completion and you can say, I'm done and you can frame it and put it up on a wall. It's a finished product. But as you well know, in psychotherapy, we can never experience the satisfaction of knowing that we've helped our clients become finished products. Um, but there is a, a concept or a metaphor that's not too far away from jigsaw puzzling that I can and do use with clients. And, and I wanna introduce it with the story of someone, a client I've worked with for many, many years. Um, I first saw Rachel, uh, uh, that's not her real name, but I'm calling her Rachel, over 30 years ago. And uh, I didn't know that I'd be working with her for over three decades. Uh, here's a picture that captures my sense of Rachel. Um, it's not her, I'm, I'm protecting her confidentiality and privacy. Uh, Rachel did sign a release uh, for me to be able to talk with her um, it, as long as I protect her confidentiality and name. When I asked Rachel, brought her in, uh, she said she'd been feeling depressed, uh, but that was just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, I didn't learn more of the full picture on, well into the first year of therapy. Later, she said it took her that long to build some trust in me, to feel some safety with me in spite of the fact that I'm a man. I'd learned that she'd been sexually abused for over five years. Um, she'd been raped multiple times and was feeling suicidal. Um, on top of that, she had been infected with HIV as a result of her rapes. Much of our initial work in therapy focused on helping her find safety from her abusers and from her own suicidal impulses. It took me a few more years to learn that Rachel had dissociated into multiple personas as a result of her terrible traumas. Rachel knew little about her personas. And as I became acquainted with these alters, I learned that these personas knew relatively little about each other, but they were in conflict competing for the, the central place in Rachel's consciousness. Rachel was fragmented in, in many ways. And her fragmentation was really disabling. So I'd like to use my work with Rachel to illustrate my thoughts on brokenness and wholeness. I think that much of our work with people is all about helping them find greater wholeness in their lives. And in the past 15 years, I've been thinking what wholeness means and what its implications are for how we understand and our approach our work as therapists. Wholeness, I believe, has a, a vital place in psychotherapy. And I, I'd go further and suggest, as my title lays out, it may be the heart and soul of psychotherapy. My thinking here is, is very much in progress. Uh, it does appear in my book on spiritual struggles that I wrote with Julie Exline. I've been doing some research studies on wholeness as well, but this work is still very early here. And so what I wanna do is share not a finished product by any means, but, but some of my reflections on wholeness, uh, what it is, what it isn't, how we can draw on this idea more consciously and more explicitly to enhance our work as therapists. Um, much of the material I'm going to be talking about with you is, I admit, uh, pretty conceptual, and I hope you don't find it boring. Um, but I think the ideas are going to come to life as I illustrate them through my work with Rachel. So I'm going to bring these abstract ideas down to earth with um, the story of Rachel, who's a remarkable person. So this is the first time I've ever given this talk on wholeness. And I'm, I'm a little, I'm happy about it. And I'm excited about it. I couldn't imagine a better group to talk to about it, but I'm a little nervous too. 
So uh, please feel free to share um, whatever thoughts or comments or questions you may have, and I will be learning from you. I should say I'm about to start a book about wholeness using Rachel as my, as my centerpiece here. Um, so any thoughts, comments, or suggestions you have for me are really going to be welcome. So let me say a few words about what wholeness is um, and what it isn't. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with the what it isn't side first. First, wholeness is not a new concept. William James, the uh, founding figure in psychology, spoke about the essential task of moving from divided to unified selves. Parker Palmer talked about overcoming internal and external constraints to be able to discover and, and realize one's inner wholeness. He said we come to the earth into life with an inner wholeness. James Fowler proposed that in the course of development, in faith development in particular, over the lifespan, we move from less to greater wholeness. So you'll, you'll detect in, in my, my thinking here, strains of the wisdom of these and other writers. Second, wholeness is not one thing. It's not limited to any single attribute or even set of attributes. It covers our thinking, our emotions, our attitudes, our actions, and our relationships. When we think of wholeness, we think of people in their, their entirety. And that really makes it challenging and maybe off-putting. But to that, I'd say, well, isn't that just the challenge we face in psychotherapy? Aren't we approaching people in their entirety? Third, wholeness is not simply psychological. It's biological, psychological, social, and spiritual. It reflects the reality that we're biopsychosocial spiritual beings. Um, I want to stress that on the social side, wholeness refers to a person in context. When someone comes through our therapy door, they're not just coming alone. They bring a history, a family, loving and conflictual relationships, and a larger community and culture. From a wholeness perspective, we, meet, we see more than the personality of a self-contained individual. We see an individual in context. Wholeness also contains a spiritual dimension. It's interesting to note that the term holy is an etymological descendant of the old English word helig, which translates into wholeness and health. The notion that we're broken is a, a precept fundamental to the world's great religious traditions, as you know. And each tradition offers in its own way an antidote to our brokenness that in some way involves a movement to greater wholeness. Just to take one example, according to Jewish mystical tradition, in the creative process, God withdrew to form a finite space or vessel within the infinite realm and then injected a ray of divine light into this vessel. But the vessel wasn't able to fully contain the light and it shattered. In this sense, the universe was broken from its very beginning. And according to this mystical tradition, it's up to humankind to repair the damage by acts of caring, compassion, and justice that bring wholeness and healing to the fragmented world. So there's a spiritual dimension um, to what it means to be whole, but that spiritual dimension is often neglected in the ways we think about ourselves. And it's neglected oftentimes in the ways that our major institutions think about people. I just came across this uh, notation that the NIH, NIH, the National Institutes of Health, their Center for uh, Complementary and Integrative Health has just uh, crafted an initiative uh, on whole person health. They call it whole person health. 
which they define as uh, consisting of biological, psychological, social, and environmental dimensions. Not a word of spirituality in that. That's a notable omission, but it's not an uncommon omission when it comes to our health and mental health institutions. But I'm gonna try to make the case here, and now I know I'm already preaching to the choir that we can't understand wholeness if we don't understand holiness, if we don't understand the spiritual dimension. Fourth point is that wholeness is not the opposite of brokenness. No one goes through life without wounds, scars, and some degree of brokenness. Um, these experiences can't be eliminated, and maybe they shouldn't, because brokenness can be sources of wisdom and growth and ultimately greater wholeness. The question is, how do we find ways to incorporate brokenness into our lives? And as this slide um, presents, the Japanese art form of kintsugi, which means golden joining, offers a beautiful way to think about this process. Kintsugi reflects the influences of Shinto, Buddhist, and Confucian thought. It involves the preservation and repair of broken ceramic pieces by applying gold or silver filigree that bonds the broken pieces. And they highlight rather than conceal the brokenness in the reformed object. Through Kintsugi, wholeness is literally created out of brokenness. And the result is a work of art, and one I'd say of greater beauty than the original unblemished ceramic piece. I think this is a very hopeful metaphor for clients who feel irrevoc irrevocably broken. We can, uh, that's my dog you're hearing barking in the background if you can pick up on it. And if he keeps it up, I'm gonna shut my door. So sorry about that. The object of therapy is to help clients put the pieces of their lives together, and the outcome may be a work of art that's more precious and more beautiful than what, than what they started with. This is, again, a really helpful metaphor for clients. I had one client, when we terminated therapy, uh, she sent me a thank you note and addressed it to Ken Sugi. So I took that as really high praise. <clears throat> The integration of wholeness into our under, a brokenness into our understanding of wholeness then is I think an advance over notions of well-being and flourishing and positive psychology that I think have given short shrift to the realities of pain, suffering, and brokenness in our lives. The last point I want to make about wholeness is it's not static, it's not fixed, it's not final. It's dynamic, and it continuously evolves over the lifespan. Because we're all limited beings, we can never reach complete wholeness. At any point in time, we can see where we might stand in our movement towards wholeness. But wholeness is really an ideal, and it's always going to be a work in progress. I was uh, talking about wholeness to someone who said, well, What's the point if we can't reach perfect wholeness? Why bother? Well, we can talk more about that later, but, but I responded by saying that the goal of greater wholeness is still valuable, even if we can't fully attain it. Uh, to be good is a nice goal, even though it's not to be perfect. It's good to be wholer, if you pardon my misuse of the English language. It's good to be wholer. Okay, so how do we think about wholeness? What is it? Let me stress two points here. Wholeness is a potential. As I had mentioned before, some writers say we're born whole and we simply need to release what we have inside of ourselves, our natural wholeness. Um, it's really a very hopeful idea, but I don't really agree with it. Um, I'd say it's more accurate to, to, to believe that people have a potential or a capacity for wholeness. And that capacity for wholeness could be nurtured 
but it can also be neglected. And I see a big task of the therapeutic process is helping people grow and access their capacity for wholeness. The, the movement from brokenness to wholeness doesn't just simply occur naturally with time. Uh, instead, I, I like the way um, a children's writer, um, Nost, puts it. She writes, do not be dismayed by the brokenness in the world. All things break and all things can be mended, not with time, as they say, but with intention. I really like that. It takes intention. She says that wholeness involves work. It's not a given. And, and I would really agree with that. I also like to think of wholeness as a, uh, a kind of master virtue, as an overarching goal that we can strive for, a vision of who we might be that we can try to realize through our own effort and the help of other people. And I see my role now as in part a guide helping people along the road to greater wholeness. Okay, so for the, much of this talk now, I'm gonna focus on three ingredients of wholeness and how they can be cultivated in therapy using the story of Rachel as a, a reference point here. The first ingredient I wanna talk about is breadth and depth. Breadth refers to the capacity to face and deal with the full range of challenges and changes that life brings. Depth refers to the ability to see more deeply into life and to be able to grapple with its complexity and its intensity and its paradox. So let me say a few more about some things that contribute to breadth and depth. Breadth and depth require us to have access to a variety of tools and resources. Uh, philosopher Abraham Kaplan once wrote, give a small boy a hammer and he'll find everything that he encounters needs pounding. Call that the, the law of the instrument. But it applies not only to small children, but to the rest of us. We rely on whatever we have in our toolboxes to fix the problems we run into. Even when the tools are not suited to the task, that's what we have, that's what we use. Rachel, for instance, had multiple personas, but each was equipped with only a very limited set of tools to deal with the problems she faced. Karen, her rageful alter, couldn't interact with others without pushing them away. She had no other tools in her toolbox than anger. Ellen, her depressed persona, was overwhelmed by sadness and despair. She had no way to soothe herself. She had no other tools in her toolbox than terrible grief and sadness. Clarissa, her intellectual altar, couldn't use any feelings to guide her actions. She had no tools in her toolbox other than intellect. And Rachel herself, was crippled by her lack of awareness of her anger, her depression, and her intellectual processing. These, pro these aspects of herself had become compartmentalized. And because the fragmented parts of Rachel didn't communicate fully with each other or Rachel, Rachel was really unable to draw on all of her resources. Now, no single person can have all the possible skills, resources, and qualities that we need to deal with life. Uh, after all, uh, we're only human, and each of us is faced with choices about how to use our limited, finite resources. Um, if we avoid these hard choices and instead try to master every tool for living, we're bound to be frustrated. Uh, psychologist Edward Sampson once critiqued the movement towards what he called self-contained individualism in the United States, arguing that those who hope to be entire unto themselves are likely to be dissatisfied and disconnected from each other. He believed that it's better to recognize our incompleteness and become part of a larger network in which we can support, sustain, and complement each other. 
In therapy, I think we become one element of that larger network and we help our clients broaden their resources by borrowing tools from others and they may be borrowing tools from us. A second element of, uh, that goes into breadth and depth is the ability to see the darker side. And none of us goes through life unscathed. Pain, suffering, frailty, and struggle are all a part of the human condition. But even with access to the best of healthcare and efforts to steer clear of all bad habits and the comfort of living in a secure nest of loving relationships, the reality is that we'll still age, we'll still encounter accidents, we'll still encounter loss, and we will eventually die. And, and most recently, we've come to face to face with these existential realities in the form of the COVID-19 pandemic. But what makes these dark existential truths especially problematic is the unwillingness to face them. Back to Rachel. I often wondered what led to Rachel's fragmentation and her resistance to change. And it often come back to her difficulty accepting the negative feelings her rage, her depression, her fear, her loneliness that had been set loose by the horrific rapes she'd suffered. These, these traumas had pushed her beyond normal coping capacity. And fragmentation, in fact, was, I think, a survival strategy. Fragmentation was a way to live with unbelievable pain. And, and the fact that she was able to, she was able to hold a job as a teacher she was able to have some close relationships. In spite of her fragmentation was a real testament to her strength and resilience. I saw Rachel's fragmentation hundreds of times in therapy. For years, she resisted talking with me about her rape experiences. She'd take some tentative steps and then she would dissociate, transforming into one of her alters. And in doing so, she didn't have to face the negative feelings that felt so overwhelming. I'd ask Rachel to try to hold on to herself and say a bit more about her feelings, such as anger. But she would shake her head almost violently and repeat, it's just too much. It's just too much. Karen, her angry altar was, was particularly resistant to my efforts to get her to talk. And on in one particularly important and really memorable session, uh, Rachel finally began to open up about some of her feelings. Karen began the next session by announcing that she had made the unilateral decision to terminate therapy with me. She said that she felt my efforts to help her become more whole, we're only making her more vulnerable to future attacks. She said only by staying constantly vigilant could she protect herself. And of course she hadn't checked out her decision with the other personas, including Rachel, and they were not happy about it at all. Ellen, her depressed persona took, uh, took control in the session and spoke up and said, no, no, we can't end therapy. Ken is the only person who understands us. He's the only person who can help us. And Karen replied by saying, you need to toughen up. You're just a sissy. And this would go back and forth. And this is what, what I was pretty much used to in working with Rachel. It was kind of like doing family therapy. I, I addressed my comments to Rachel that session because she was the primary personality. She's the one I had contracted with in therapy. And I told her about the conflict that was going on within herself, which she was unaware of, and told her that I wouldn't try to insist she return to therapy. I said, look, you've had enough of men trying to control you, and, and I wouldn't add to that. I said, I think you need help with someone, but maybe someone else I said, you might want to see a female therapist. You might want to see someone you're more comfortable with. And so that's how we left it with Ellen um, really upset, leaving. No, no, we can't. We have to come back. We have to come back again and see Ken. No one else will help us. 
So I didn't know whether she would return for her next appointment, but much to my relief, she did. And this is a real turning point in therapy. I'll say a little bit more about that next therapy session because it was a key. But I should stress that by not talking about her rapes, Rachel could avoid her fear that once she descended into that darkness, she would never see any light again. And that's what she feared. If she started to talk about her pain, she would get lost in it. She would drown in it. But in all of her avoidance, Rachel also prevented herself from coming to terms with her emotions and, and living with them, painful as they were, living with them as a whole human being. In much of my therapy with Rachel, I tried to help her accept the reality of her suffering and reassure her that she could really talk about her trauma in small steps without dissociating and without drowning in the pain. She could live with and she could live through her dark times. Oops. Religious systems can contribute to avoidance of the dark side. Uh, and in this vein, uh, psychologist and theologian, I'm sure many of you know Carrie Doring, um, described a vigil service that she attended for the 12 people who were killed in the Aurora uh, theater shooting in 2012. Uh, and you know she lives in Denver, Carrie, so she was able to go to this service. <clears throat> She noted that many of the religious leaders there offered prayers, uh, invoking the theme of resurrection and healing. But she said only a few of the leaders offered what she felt was also needed, a period of lamentation in which the survivors could voice their suffering and reflect on the darkness and the precariousness that are also part of life. A lot of psychological research has shown that the effort to avoid the dark side makes matters worse. And Thomas Merton uh, put it this way. He said, the one who does most to avoid suffering is in the end, the one who suffers the most. Struggles and suffering may be inevitable, but the added pain that comes by trying to avoid these experiences isn't according to one quote that I think uh, comes from R.D. Lang, even though it's not clear. Um, he said, there's a great deal of pain in life, and perhaps the only pain that can be avoided is the pain that comes from trying to avoid pain. Um, uh, some, a similar quote comes from uh, Barbara Brown Taylor's uh, book, Learning to Walk in the Dark, and uh, she wrote, I've learned that things in the dark that I, I've learned things in the dark that I could never have learned in the light, things that have saved my life over and over again, so that there's really only one logical conclusion. I need darkness as much as I need light. <clears throat> A third element of breadth and depth is the ability to see beneath the surface. Now, what does that mean? It means that things are not necessarily what they appear to be, that there may be a greater reality underlying our usual sense of reality. And that this perspective really uh, takes issue with the popular phrase, uh, uh, it is what it is. Um, from this perspective, Sometimes there's more to it than what it looks like. Sometimes it isn't what it is. You can tell how much fun I am at parties when people say that, and I challenge them about it, it is what it is, um, or that's all there is to it. Here's an example. Take a look at this um, figure ground illusion at the bottom of the page. And uh, tell me, what do you see? Most of us will focus either on the chalice between the two uh, uh, faces looking at each other or the two figures looking at each other. 
But there's other stuff going on in this picture. For instance, if you look closely at the woman's face, do you see the, the uh, woman sitting there with holding onto a sombrero? The tip of the sombrero or the rim of the sombrero is her eyebrow. Her left arm is her nose. And her uh, left leg becomes her, her chin. Take a look at the man. His right arm is the uh, is his nose. And his guitar that he's playing, if you can see the guitar, is his mustache. You can go on. But there's there's even more to it than that, because look at what's going on in his ear, his left ear. Do you see the woman coming out of an arched doorway? Can you see that? That's coming out of his ear. So the point in all of this is that if we just focused on the foreground, we miss what's going on in the background. Looking beneath the surface means looking beyond the foreground of a picture to view it in depth. It involves being able to see both the, the foreground and the background to see with depth. And seeing beneath the surface rests in part on the skill of taking a step back and reflecting on the thoughts and feelings and experiences of oneself and others. Um, John Allen, the clinical psychologist, talks about this as mentalization. I like that, mentalization. And it's the capacity to know one's own mind, understand the minds of others, appreciate one's past, present, and future, and for some, a transcendent reality. Reflectiveness involves not only rational processing, but also simple awareness, mindfulness, and intuitiveness. And it's a really a safeguard against getting overly caught up in experience and rushing to overly simple solutions. This kind of mentalization or mindfulness is a safeguard against um, rushing to uh, respond impulsively. It's an essential prerequisite for emotional self-regulation and regulation of our thoughts and behaviors and, and relationships. And really, I think encouraging reflectiveness is one of the most important things we do in therapy. We try to teach people to reflect on themselves and their lives. And we're kind of guides or coaches in helping them learn how to reflect. This ability to see beneath the surface gets special emphasis within the religious and spiritual world. Um, there's no shortage of references to spirituality as really a way of seeing. And one of the major functions of all religious institutions is to help people see more deeply. People are taught to see the sacred in many aspects of life, in work, work becomes a vocation, in marriage, it becomes a sacred covenant, in parenting, in close relationships, in special moments in time that become sacred moments, and in life as a whole. Seen through this sacred lens, life takes on greater dimensionality and depth. And here's an example. I've, I've got lots of examples of what it means to see through the lens of the sacred. But this comes from Chief, Chief Seattle of the Squamish tribe who wrote this in 1887, and it illustrates how uh, nature can be seen as sacred. And it's certainly the case within uh, indigenous uh, tribes and Native Americans. Every part of this soil is sacred in the estimation of my people, he says. Every hillside, every valley, every plain and grove has been hallowed by some sad or happy event in long day in days long vanished. Even the rocks, which seem to be dumb and dead as they swelter in the sun along the silent shore, thrill with memories of stirring events connected with the lives of my people. So he's saying that the earth that people live on and live by is sacred, and part of the reason there's been so much conflict around uh, 
th this issue at times because we're really fighting for what we hold to be sacred. I've often thought of the work that we do uh, in, in our therapy as a kind of um, spiritual ophthalmology, uh, helping people see more deeply into their lives, helping people discover what may be sacred in their lives. This process of seeing through a sacred lens has been tied to a number of benefits. In research studies, we've done a number of these. People who see through this sacred lens experience more powerful spiritual emotions. We we'll call them psycho-spiritual, gratitude, awe, uplift, and joy. People who see through a sacred lens experience greater meaning in life, a sense of who we are that links past and present to future, and enduring connections among people who share a deeper way of seeing the sacred. Seeing the sacred is also tied to more positive psychological adjustment and greater continuity. Let me shift now to a second ingredient of wholeness. Life affirmation. And let's go back to Rachel. In my over 30 years of work with her, I wondered why does she keep coming back for treatment? What was I really offering her? It took me many years to figure it out. And the, the answer was kind of simple, really. R Rachel's personality had fragmented into several altars, but the altars had one thing in common. Not one of them was able to offer an ounce of compassion for herself. Not one could offer any hope for her future. I had encouraged Rachel to seek out support, hope, and compassion from other people. But her efforts were really met with stigma and rejection. And much of that was tied to her HIV diagnosis. And uh, again, she was going through HIV in the early days of the disease when there was terrible stigma out there. Uh, Rachel was the mother of, uh, Rachel was a stepmother, a god with this, godmother to three children and the mother the biological mother of these three godchildren cut Rachel off from seeing the children after Rachel shared her diagnosis that was just unbelievably painful to her and after that she really refused to take the risk of opening up to others for a long long time <clears throat> Rachel was also weighted down by the tremendous anger, fear, and shame she felt. And, and these feelings also interfered with reaching out for support. Spiritual support was out of the question for her when she first came to therapy. Uh, Rachel was furious with God. She felt the rapes were a divine punishment that had been inflicted on her in response to an abortion that she'd had when she was 13. It wasn't an abortion she wanted, but her mother pushed her into it. But Rachel was angry with God, who she believed had dealt with her in a, such a cruel way. In short, Rachel was unable to find any affirmation in her life. And this was a, a deficit that made it almost impossible for her to move forward from her trauma and spiritual struggles. I think the main reason she kept going to therapy over the years was that I offered her that vital ingredient of compassion and hope that none of her personas was able to generate for herself and that none of the others in her world had offered her. And in some sense, I think I became another sorely needed, compassionate, caring persona. I became another altar for Rachel. Ultimately, the therapy did help her recover some sense of affirmation from others and from the sacred. Life affirmation really refers to qualities that add warmth and comfort to our world. Life affirmation doesn't mean that suffering, pain, and struggle are minimized. That would only lead to the myopia that 
creates problems of its own. But an affirming perspective insists that darkness doesn't have the only or final word on life. Hope remains possible. And certainly the power of affirmation is, is uh, supported in a lot of research coming from positive psychology. And, and this research shows that life at, at its best is more than the absence of distress and disorder. Um, the positive in life is as authentic as the negative and building strengths may be as important as addressing weaknesses. Religion is a prominent source of life affirmation. Religious systems of thought and practice really figure large as sources of life affirmation. Few traditions deny the existence of pain and suffering and evil, but all of them place suffering in a larger benevolent context. It may be the promise of salvation in Christianity, the hope in the repair of a broken world within Judaism, the attainment of enlightenment in Buddhism or the promise of eternal life in, within Islam. In spite of the, the many problems and troubles in our worlds, these traditions maintain that life remains a precious gift. I'll mention two specific resources from religion that, that are uh, affirmational. We have benevolent reappraisals of, situ of stressful situations. Research has shown that religiousness is not tied to denial or suppression of pain, but it's tied to positive reappraisals of stressful situations in a more ultimately benevolent spiritual light. And this is just one example of a caregiver to someone with Alzheimer's. And this caregiver says, it's the most rewarding and devastating experience in my life. The experience, the illness is teaching me to gain strength from the Lord. Religious traditions also offer their adherents with a variety of positive coping resources, um, guidance and comfort and care from God, spiritual support from family, friends, uh, and clergy, religious rituals, and experiences of spiritual connectedness. And this cluster of positive spiritual coping methods has been tied to uh, stress-related growth. As a matter of fact, in one statistical summary of 103 studies, positive religious coping and optimism emerged as the strongest predictors of growth following major life stresses and trauma. So one of the things we do is we help our clients access their positive religious resources um, on their journey to greater wholeness. Uh, Rachel was ultimately able to achieve an important transformation when she reconnected with her church and priest and was able to find some healing for her guilt uh, over the abortion uh, through the sacrament of reconciliation. A third ingredient of wholeness is cohesiveness. And this refers to the degree to which the individual's life is well organized. In a cohesive life, the various bits and pieces values, impulses, action, feelings, beliefs, and relationships, they're coordinated into a, a meaningful pattern. Cohesiveness helps propel people to a life of enriching purpose and satisfaction along the way. Uh, in contrast, incohesiveness is marked by a lack of organization, design, and coherence. Just the problems Rachel was experiencing by virtue of her fragmented personality. With her personas, with her personas unable or unwilling to communicate, let alone negotiate, Rachel was in constant flux. She was driven here and there by whatever persona, persona was in control. And she came to therapy because she was simply unable to create order, a sense of oneness out of these disparate pieces. So let me note some of the elements that go into cohesiveness. One element is having an authentic guiding vision. Uh, a guiding vision acts like a true compass to give life direction and meaning. It can develop early on. In the words of this is Anne Franks, in her own words, she said, I know what I want. 
I have a goal and opinion. I have a religion and love. Let me be myself, and then I'm satisfied. She had a sense of herself and a vision of where she might want to go in her life. On the other hand, people who struggle to find a guiding vision, in some sense, are like a drifting boat on a, on a, a boat without a rudder at sea. And we often see people like this who are struggling with a lack of meaning. And the idea of them adrift at sea is really, to me, a very apt metaphor. Towards the latter years in our work together, Rachel developed a number of serious health problems <clears throat> related to her HIV status and her, um, and her uh, she hospitalizations, painful medical procedures, and her kidneys began to fail. Her physicians recommended that she go on dialysis, um, but Rachel resisted. Um, she had read that kidney failure was one of the least painful ways to die. And she asked me, why should I live? What do I have to live for? And quite a question. And I gave it a lot of thought. And Here's how I responded. I, I acknowledged that she had suffered terrible losses in her life, her emotional health, her physical health, her jobs, her hopes, her dreams, and nothing anyone could do could bring back those losses. But I told her that even on dialysis, she could still hope for sacred moments, moments of deep connection with the people she cared about, Moments in which she could deal with unfinished business in her life. Moments in which she could learn more about herself. Moments in which she could still bring her caring, her just her sense of justice, her sense of humor. She had a great sense of humor. And moments which took her further along her journey to the goal of greater wholeness, which is the goal we've been working on for over 30 years. She gave it a lot of thought and decided to go on dialysis. And Rachel lived for another three years. And there were certainly years of more pain, more suffering, but there were also years which contained many sacred moments, moments that she said she did treasure, moments that she said she was glad that she had stuck around to experience. And even at the end of her life, she was able to generate a guiding vision that helped sustain her through these last years. Cohesiveness also rests on a particular kind of wisdom. I call it weaving wisdom. It's the, the wisdom to know how to create an overarching design of your life. And discernment, I think, is really important here, knowing when to do what. Uh, as we hear in the serenity prayer of uh, theologian Ronald Neighbor, God grant me the serenity to accept the things I can't change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. We try to help our clients become better weavers in their lives, and that's an important part of what we do. Weaving wisdom is also connected to the skill of balancing. And this is always a work in progress. Permanent equilibrium is something impossible because the shifting winds of life throw even the most sure-footed people off balance from time to time. Uh, we feel like we've got our life in balance and then whoops, here comes another breeze. Finding balance can be really complicated, especially when we, when we polarize our human motives and attributes, when we create conflict between being self-centered or other-centered, conflict between reason and intuition, conflict between do we gain immediate or delayed gratification, conflict between work and family, the challenge in finding what Carl Menninger talked about as the vital balance isn't to pick one or other of these competing elements. It's that would only um, that would only create more unbalancing. To select one attribute to the exclusion of the others would lead to more problems. Just consider these examples: sacrificing the family to satisfy cravings of alcohol, drugs, or gambling. 
living a constricted life so you don't have to face anxiety. Minimization of sexual abuse to protect larger institutions that have condoned and supported it. And imbalance was certainly a problem that Rachel faced. Uh, none of her personas could access the redeeming qualities of the others. So she was often out of kilter. Balance, William James said, um, is a necessary corrective to human excess. He said, I love this quote, strong affections need a strong will. Strong intellect needs strong sympathies to keep life steady. Oh, and then strong active powers need a strong intellect. The last element of cohesiveness I want to mention is paradox. Ours is an age of paradox, uh, and even the notion of truth has been challenged. Uh, Niels Bohr, the Nobel Prize winning physicist, once said that the opposite of a correct statement is a false statement, but the opposite of a profound truth may well be another profound truth. Incongruity and paradox are parts of our lives. We're onion-like beings. We're made up of layers of contradictory thoughts and feelings and connections and desires, contradictions we may be only partially aware of. Simultaneously, we can love and hate. We can seek isolation and close connection. We can pursue pleasures inconsistent with our deepest values and wonder, why did I do that? And, and the list goes on. The idea is that we're contradictory paradoxical beings living in a contradictory paradoxical world isn't the way we usually think about ourselves. But cohesiveness and wholeness call for this ability not to eliminate, but recognize and reconcile incongruities and multiple truths. This notion is really present in the stages of James of faith of James Fowler. His, his penultimate stage of faith, conjunctive faith, is marked by the recognition that the truth we hold is partial and incomplete, he says. In this stage, people shift from either or to both and thinking, he said. In this stage, we become alive to paradox and the truth in apparent contradictions. I love that. The truth in apparent contradictions. In her book, Sacred Therapy, Estelle Frankel illustrates this perspective through the story of two Jews who seek out a rabbi traveling with his wife to help them resolve a conflict. When the first is finished making his case, the rabbi says, you are right. When the second has made his argument, the rabbi says, you are right. Perplexed by her husband's responses, the rabbi's wife exclaims, how can they both be right? The rabbi responds, you are also right. By the way, I think humor is one of the best ways of coming to terms with paradox and incongruity. Fowler says that ultimately it's a sense of uh, an underlying transcendence that brings unity and wholeness to this human kaleidoscope of contradictory thoughts and feelings. And that's central to the stage of faith, the highest stage a universalizing faith in which people experience a sense of cohesiveness within themselves and others. And Estelle Frankel makes the same point. She says, although we're both body and soul, finite and tied to the infinite, separate and interconnected, we exist within an ineffable unity. I love that. Ineffable unity in which all our particularities dissolve. So they're saying ultimately is something spiritual that helps us come to terms with life incongruities and paradox. And I want to come back to Rachel for one of the last times here to make this point. Now, recall that Rachel's faith and spirituality were another casualty of her trauma. She was furious with a God who believed she had punished her unjustly for her rapes and abortion. And she was angry with her religious community that she felt had abandoned her because she had committed an unforgivable sin. And yet there remained in Rachel 
a sacred spark, a spiritual life-giving spark, and a force for wholeness. Let me tell you what happened when Rachel returned to therapy after her angry persona, Karen, had threatened to hijack the others and terminate. I breathed a sigh of relief when she entered the door that day. I was worried she wasn't coming back. Um, but Rachel came in, and she calmly sat down, and she pulled out a Bible. I'd never seen her pull out a Bible before, and she never saw herself as a religious or spiritual person. But in a very soft voice that I hadn't heard before, she said, there's something I'd like to read to all of you. And here's what she read. If the foot shall say, because I'm not the hand, I'm not of the body, it's therefore not of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? But now are they many members, yet but one body. And the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee. Nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Nay, much more those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. I was really struck by the power of what Rachel had read and said. And the other personas, including Karen, had been silenced. Um, using scripture, Rachel had made an eloquent plea for wholeness. She had spoken about the important and even necessary place each of her personas had in her life. And this was, I think, Rachel's spiritual side, perhaps one more persona. They were giving, having a voice. Um, I'd rarely hear from that spiritual side in my further work with Rachel, even though I tried to draw it out. But I'm convinced that it remained a part of who she was and an important ally in our work to help her find greater wholeness in life. So let me conclude. I really believe that issues of wholeness are oftentimes an implicit part of therapy. And I've tried to make them implicit more explicit here, moving what's in the background to the foreground. And this is a great picture. I don't know if you can really tell. It looks like it's, again, a figure ground illusion. And it looks like clouds in the background in a, and a, uh, a Roman aqueduct looking thing. But the, it becomes, a sail, those become sailing ships as they get closer to us. I think that most clinical issues kinds bring to us uh, represent something that's broken, something missing, or the pieces of life that don't fit together. And these are the feelings that uh, Rachel uh, drew Rachel into treatment. And our clients enlist us in the process of putting together the bits and pieces of their lives so they can find greater purpose and significance. As I said, wholeness is always a work in progress. We never reach permanent wholeness. And Rachel herself, she had hoped she'd find complete unity, uh, but that simply wasn't possible for her. Um, there are too many ongoing traumas and stressors. I suggested a, a more realistic goal for her, which was becoming more whole, becoming wholer. And she was able to accept that as something worthy of striving for. I think she did become more whole, and I think it's a worthwhile goal for all of us. I think, I hope you see that some of these ideas can provide a real conceptual and practical handholds in our efforts to help clients grow through times of stress and struggle. Uh, I really do think wholeness is the heart and soul of what we're about. Uh, we try to help people cultivate ingredients of wholeness. We try to help them find new tools for distress and pain, see themselves and others more clearly, find affirmation for themselves, others in the world, discover an authentic guiding vision. We help people accept life's incongruities and paradoxes and puzzles. In some ways, I think we really try to help people become jigsaw puzzlers, uh, locating some missing pieces and maybe finding greater enjoyment in the process of putting the pieces together in a puzzle that's always changing and will never be completed. Uh, these reflections that I've shared with you are still very much under development. My jigsaw puzzling also never ends. Um, at this point, I'd like to hear from you. Any thoughts, reactions, or comments? Um, 
Dr. Pargaman, I want to thank you on behalf of the group. Um, Rachel, do you, there we go. I, um, I love, you said at the beginning, you thought you were maybe preaching to the choir. And my response is, I think you're speaking on our behalf. And um, that makes me happy that, that where you sit in the professional world feels like it adds depth and breadth to what we've been doing and brings us a part of this larger whole. So it makes me really happy. So um, I, I've invited people to put your questions in the chat to, for you. This is the time where it's like our conversation. I, I so clear we are all doing the same work in different ways. Um, see, I can't tell if this is a question or comment. I've come to think about salvation as wholeness and that spiritual care is a way of participating in God's ongoing work of salvation, that it's more about that. Um, I don't know if you have a comment on that. Um, well, I think um, what's what I find is that every religious tradition has its own, I think, language for describing what wholeness how to talk about wholeness, how to understand it, and, and what are the steps that people have to take? What does the journey have to look like in, for people to reach it? And so I think salvation is, is, again, is one way that people can understand that journey to wholeness. What does it really take? And, and being able to uh, find that salvation seems to me in, in, many, in, 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 in the thoughts of many people and many chaplains and therapists, I think, would would share in that language. Thank you. I have a question for someone who's asking about research opportunities. I don't know exactly what he means. He says uh, he works with um, spiritually integrated mental health care and consults uh, with visits and classes with adolescents and short-term patients. So I don't know um, if there's research to follow or if there's research that's looking for people. I'm not exactly sure what he means. So. Well, this is, um, if, if I take the question correctly, I, I think that uh, there are opportunities in this area to do, to do research. The notion of, of whole person health, whole person functioning, um, I think it's, it's right on the uh, edge of becoming more mainstream in the field. It's a very different way of thinking about people because we tend to focus on itty bitty concepts and, and um and goals that we try to achieve with people in our counseling. Wholeness is like the opposite of that. I mean, it's it's being whole. So how do you study it? How do you measure it? How do you know if someone has made progress towards wholeness? How do you study that in a research way? You know, it's very challenging. We've done a few studies on it, but I can tell you it is, it's a challenging process. One of the things that we've just completed, for instance, is it's, or about to complete, is a study I've done with um, uh, my wonderful colleague, uh, Serena Wong, and some other researchers as well, uh, where we're interviewing people from the United States and uh, Israel. Uh, and Panini Russo Netzer, a, a wonderful psychologist in Israel, is taking the lead. And we're interviewing people about their journey from brokenness to wholeness across cultures. And we're doing qualitative analyses to understand the language that they use. How do they experience it? What are the challenges that they face? And then somehow I think that qualitative study, I think may do more justice to uh, understanding that journey from brokenness to wholeness in a, in a, a more systematic way than maybe through trying to measure it through research tools. But there are research opportunities here. So I, I would encourage you to, to explore them in various uh, graduate programs in psychology or uh, pastoral care or chaplaincy. Thank you. Um, there's lots and lots of words of affirmation for your presentation that we'll make sure you get. But um, uh, someone asked you to, who was commenting on um, this, the slow, steady journey she made to share the experience of the raves with you and is asking if you have any further comments about what the significance of her um, doing that in the presence of you as a male therapist. Well, <clears throat> I was really honored that she... Uh, trusted me enough to continue to work with me because I would have totally understood her not being able to form that relationship. Men had just been sources of 
of terrible trauma. I, I, I called it evil. We, we started to use the language of evil because what you went through was truly evil and despicable. I can't use hard, harsh enough words. And yet here she was talking to a man. And I, I'll share this with you. One time later in therapy, I said, I brought that up. I said, you know, Rachel, I'm so honored that you talked to me because I am a man and you've had such awful experiences by the hands of men. And she says, she said to me, she said, you're not a man, you're Ken. And so she was able to see more deeply herself. She could see me, she could see beyond my gender and okay. see me, see kind of see into my heart see into my soul, which is how I saw her too. I should, I should add, um, Rachel was terribly obese. Uh, when mm -hmm. she came in, she was probably 300 pounds. And um, her face was so heavy, it was almost like a mask. Mm -hmm. But she didn't want to do anything about the issue of weight. I mean, she wanted a mask. She wanted mm -hmm. to be as unattractive as she could be. Uh, so that uh, men would stay away from her. Um, so I learned to see her. Initially, the first session, I was just really focused on, you know, her weight and concern about her weight. And then after a while, I just, she was Rachel. That's who I saw. And I was Ken. That's who she saw. So lovely that with but coming down to the wholeness that be, that gets expressed in all those different ways. That's right. Someone is, uh, who is, is listening to your um, presentation through the lens of internal family systems and uh, having access to her core self beyond the other parts. And she's wondering if you have thoughts about that, and that theory and how it might interact here. Yeah, it was. I often thought about her in terms of family therapy and in terms of uh, family systems, because um that's I was working with a family of alters who are very disconnected from each other and in terrible conflict with each other. So the the goal wasn't in, in family therapy, I wouldn't try to eliminate one family member or another. I would try to facilitate communication. And that's what I tried to do with Rachel. I would uh, it took a while, but she eventually gave me permission to audio tape the sessions. So Rachel, mm. as the central figure, the ego here, could hear the other personas and she could respond to them. And then I would play her responses to the other alters. So that was very helpful because they began to talk with each other kind of directly. <laughs> um, instead of everything through me, they began to talk to each other through the tapes. Wow. And um, I think that was really facilitate it. And Rachel, one of the big changes was with time, she became more accepting of her alters. And she no longer would get annoyed with them or not want to listen to them. And she was actually able with some coaching to talk to them and try to reassure them and let them know she wasn't trying to eliminate them, but valued their perspective. And if these alters were actually physical people in the room, I'm not sure how different the wow. the therapy would have looked. I think I probably would have been doing some of the same things. So yeah, family systems theory really helpful in in that context. Okay, I have two comments or questions here that are similar. One is, what do you make of spirituality not being included in the concept of wholeness you presented at the beginning of the presentation? And then someone else asked, what prevents some from omitting spiritual from the concept of wholeness in the NIH thing. So it's interesting. Well, that's a, that's a really big, you know, that's really a, a big question. Um, you know, the, 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 the challenge is that, uh, you know, is that trying to integrate this dimension of who we are, which is as real as any other dimension, the biological, psychological, or social, but trying to integrate that in, uh, in what is a highly secularized uh, profession of healthcare, medical care, mental health care, is really challenging because um, most people who are, well, I'll pick on my psychologists, my psychology buddies, most psychologists are atheists 
They don't believe in the reality of some of the things we've been talking about here. And so they see it as kind of uh, delusional, the, the, what we're talking about, and something that should be discouraged rather than encouraged. So they don't have that picture has begun to change. We're now seeing a lot more um, openness and, and uh, willingness to uh, address spirituality, in part because of the research that's shown its, uh, its powerful benefits for the lives of many people. And also, we're seeing more training in this area uh, in the healthcare professions on how healthcare professionals can be, at the very least, more sensitive to the topic and, and consider collaborating or consulting with uh, chaplains and people within and religious leaders and professionals. So certainly within chaplaincy, there's been some progress made there. Probably less progress in medical, in medicine, and in, in psychology, but I think there is some progress now. We're just completing a, uh, a grant-funded project to train um, uh, people in psychology, social work, uh, family and therapy, family and marital counseling, and counseling psychology, how to do spiritually competent uh, care, how to integrate that into mental health care. It's very basic, the kind of things we're teaching them, but we, we believe, I believe, that should be a prerequisite as important as teaching people to be responsive to other cultural diversity issues. So we're working at it. You know, you're working at it, you know, it's, and I think we, we have seen progress, but it's, uh, it's, a, uh, it's, a, it's a challenge, and I think we can't afford not to just keep trying to push forward. Yeah. Someone asked for clarification and said, did you, he, this person thought you said wholeness can only make meaning with faith tradition. Is that what you said? Uh, no, I don't think I, I said that. I'm sorry if I misspoke. I didn't, um, I didn't hear that either, but I just wanted to, yeah. Okay. No, certainly uh, meaning making can occur within the context of faith traditions. And, um, but there are people who, who are engaged in the same process outside of those. Um, but I would say that even outside of faith traditions, people uh, may make meaning in ways that are quite spiritual. I mean, when you think about uh, Native American traditions and the the sanctification of nature, well, that's they're not. It's not a traditional Western view of uh, of uh, of the world, but it's very powerful and it has lots of, I think, uh, important impact on them and the yeah. world. Yeah. It's very interesting. I have a, a child who is 37 year old now and a lawyer. And it's like he he's sort of in that Fowler middle position of there. If there's a I can't I, I can't I don't know enough to say there is no God, but I think all this is a made up of the mind. So it's interesting for me to listen to someone like that who's coming at it purely intellectually. And from my perspective, that everything has a spiritual component. But he says, nope. So it's so it's interesting, even what we mean by those words. Yeah, um, it, 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 we did a study several years ago on what people, the meaning of spirituality, and, and we found so many definitions um, mm -hmm. that we wondered whether we we're really talking with each other or through each other. But it is, I think it's, it's starting to take on more definition and boundaries. I think of spirituality is what people do to uh, discover and and build a relationship to something sacred in their lives, however they may define the sacred. But it's all about connecting to, to something deeper than or deeper than ourselves, or deeper something within ourselves. And it's the uh, it's a again a critical dimension of who we are as people. It can't be reduced to anything else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have one more question here for now that says, um, I can imagine some might react to the language of brokenness to wholeness and may resist hearing they are broken uh, and they may still feel broken. Have you encountered this and how do you respond to this? Or are there other ways to describe it? And this person said, I like your focus on fragmentation. Yeah, I mean, it, as with as with all of our concepts in, in, this, in the, the area of psychotherapy, we have to adapt the language to where the person is at. And for some people, brokenness just won't do it. Um, it's not a language that people will be respond to, or it is just too frightening for them to consider. 
Um, but that's true for many of our the things we work with. Uh, mindfulness, for instance, is another concept or, or language that some people can relate to, but some people, they hear that and they think of something that's kind of spacey or something that's, a, a, that's, that's anti-religious. And so you can't use that language. You can talk about reflection, you can talk about it in other terms, but, medit but mindfulness just won't do the trick. Um, so yeah, it's true. Uh, for some people, you can't really speak about brokenness, have to speak about other language, being in pain, um, uh, feeling distress, feeling um, like they can't put the pieces of their lives together or things don't fit. There's different ways of kind of framing that. I mean, I, I picked an obvious example of brokenness where I think, you know, with someone with a dissociative identity disorder, I mean, who can be more broken than that, where you have these discrete personas that don't even know about each other. And when they do, they can't even talk to each other. That's that's fragmentation. That's brokenness. And yet you see her and she sees you. And from that sort of central, this is back to the paradox, from that central seeing the people, you can go to, to get those different pieces. And yeah. Well, and, and the exactly. thing I haven't mentioned is, um, I mean, the focus has been on my uh, helping her, but she also helped to complete me. I, I learned a tremendous amount from her and I, I was inspired by her and she gave me strength and courage and some sense that, well, I can also, uh, I have a model I can use in my life of how I would like to deal with uh, a terminal illness, how I would like to face uh, unrelenting trauma and pain. I mean, she gave me so many gifts. And in the book, I want to make that a, a real clear point. And, I, and now that I'm thinking about it now, I wish I'd made that clear in this presentation, that this was a two-way street. And in the book, I want to make it clear that it's a the journey from brokenness to greater wholeness, which is maybe the subtitle of the book, a journey from brokenness to greater wholeness. It's a journey that we took together. Nice. Okay. I helped her along the way, but she's helped me along the way too. And she's, she's, uh, she's really enriched my life. Well, I think that's a great place to end. And I want to thank you again. That certainly is a sentiment, I think, that resonates again with us as your choir. And um, thank you so much. I hope this is not our last conversation with you. I want to remind the participants, Rachel just reposted in the chat, the course evaluation and the CE request. And I want to make a little pitch for folks for our upcoming programs on, um, you'll get more about this in your emails, but on September 22nd, Yaku Hammond from Vandermilt is going to talk about care and cultivation of restorative intelligence. And then on November the 10th, Julie Smith, and I'm sorry, I don't know the correct pronunciation of this woman's name, Yila Nimini, I think her name is, is going to talk on Indigenous people, trauma, and resilience. And in October on the 20th to 22nd, we're going to have a, a weekend conference, and not in North Carolina at Canuga this year, but in Atlanta at the Emory Conference Center, which is this beautiful place in the trees. And um, Greg Ellison is going to be back with us. So again, you'll be getting more information about those. I hope you will come to as many of these presentations as you can. This has been a very, very rich and meaningful time. And um, Rachel, I guess we can send him all the comments some kind of way so he can see all of the things people said to him that he that helped. Yeah, I'd love to see things. that. Thank you. And if you have any, if you want to contact me uh, directly through my email, I'd be happy to talk with you further. If you have any suggestions for the book I have in mind and how to present this material in, in ways that would be more effective or compelling, um, that would be great too. In, in the book, I am not going to make this nearly as academic as I did with you, um, but It'll focus a lot more on Rachel and her story, but I am going to talk about wholeness. So you're welcome to contact me. Thank you so much again. And thank you, Rachel, for hosting us. And, you know, Rachel is on a steep learning curve and she's doing great <laughs> for everything she's handling for us. Thank you very much. And thanks, thanks again, everybody, for attending. And we hope to see you at our next uh, webinar. Rachel, uh, there were some people who were pushing, uh, putting the thing in about um, asking for Dr. Pargament's email address. Is that